please turn with me in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5 and commencing at verse 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. You will say, how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breasts satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Why be captivated, my son, by an adulter adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. This is God's word. Well, I might say it often, but it really is a great pr privilege to be able to share God's Word with you. And I get so much blessing being able to study it and look through it. And I hope that it will really bless you as well as it has blessed me. This is a great passage. There's so much we could cover and so much we won't. Um, so please be blessed by it and please be looking at the passage. And I encourage you to read it when you get home again. You're going to need to, to be able to really get the depths of it and see more that I won't bring out, okay? Let's pray and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this passage here and the sin that it speaks into and challenge us, challenges us on, how it addresses sexual sin, but also how it addresses all sin for us, God. We thank you for the wisdom that this passage gives and we pray now for our eyes and our hearts and our minds to be open to your word. Please ready us, please humble us, please soften our hearts, God, and we pray that you would bring the conviction that we need, and we pray, God, that we would go away not just learning things about sin, but wanting to go away killing sin for the glory of Christ our Saviour. Amen. One thing that the Bible does again and again is expose the dark realities of sin. 
at something it seeks to keep on doing throughout the Bible. It's because sin is a deadly enemy. It tears apart lives, families, societies, churches. It leads to death and eternal destruction. It leaves us with guilt, regret, and pain. And it is the greatest joy stealer from our lives. It robs us of joy. It robs us of assurance at times. And it leaves us broken and sometimes empty of hope. But though sin is so great, such a great enemy, we as Christians, we have the hope that we are forgiven and that Christ has died to fully defeat it, don't we? Its penalty was paid for on the cross. Its power has been defeated through Jesus, who now is strengthening us to battle sin and flee from it. And the presence of sin will one day completely be gone from our lives when we are with Jesus again. But for now, for right now as Christians, we are in a battle. And we must fight against sin, this great enemy which can bring such destruction. We must fight it. As Christians, how could we ever run back to sin, to the sin that sent Christ to the cross? How could we ever run back to what Christ has died to free us from? We as God's people, we should be in turmoil when we run back to sin. When we run back to what put Christ on the cross. If we have truly repented, if we have truly turned to Christ, sin should be something we want to run from, shouldn't it? It should be. And so tonight, I want us to look at this passage and I want to help you flee from sin and see how to fight sin. And to help you do that, we need to expose the dark realities of sin. That's something that this passage does. And we must do this because when we see sin for what it is, it will help us want to run from it and flee from it again and again. And that's what Proverbs 5 does. It shows us here five dark realities about sin. And it exposes them and lays them bare for us. And every time I see them, it renews my vigor and desire to fight and battle sin. And I hope it does for you as well. So we're going to see those five dark realities about sin. But also, this passage does something else. I think we see here five points to practically fight sin. And we're going to see those as well quickly at the end. And I know that's a lot, but they all start with D to help you remember. They help me to remember them sometimes, but also they're all here in the passage. So it might be a lot to remember, but go back and you'll see them there again when you read it in your own time. So let's begin. I've been saying here that this passage exposes the dark realities of sin. And I've been talking about sin in general. But in particular, this passage is actually exposing the dark realities of a particular sin, adultery. It speaks and addresses the topic of adultery. The writer here has personified adultery as a woman. And he he seeks to show the foolishness of this sin. And we see throughout Proverbs as well, wisdom is personified as a woman. And here... The foolishness of sin and sexual sin is being shown, and the wisdom of God's way in marriage is being shown. But all that to say, even though adultery is the the focus here of this passage, sexual sin really is the focus, the principles here in this passage really apply to all sin. And so that's what I want to do. I want to pick out the principles here that apply to all sin. We could apply these things particularly to adultery and do a whole sermon on that, but I want to particularly draw out things that will apply to all sin in your life. So with that in mind, let's read now verse 1 and 2. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 begins and says, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Here the writer is calling for you, and for the son to listen, pay attention. He's about to show that sin deceives us. Sin is deadly. It brings damage to your life. It brings destruction. Sin distracts us from what what is good. It only disappoints us. And so he's saying, listen up. Listen here to the wisdom I'm about to give so that you would act and speak in a right way that won't ruin your life and the lives of others. Listen up. And so the call is for us all here, Listen here to this wisdom. The call is on me here. Listen to this wisdom. Listen to God's wisdom and what he says about sin so that it will help you fight. And the first thing we see here about sin 
in verses 3 and 4 is that sin deceives us. Have a look there, verse 3 and 4. Sin deceives us. Verse 3 says, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. So verse 1 and 2, you need to hear this, you need to listen, you need to hear this wisdom. Why? Verse 3, 4, because sin is deceptive. It's enticing. It looks really good. Just like it sometimes feels really good to pig out on soft drink or takeaway, but it's probably not too good for your health. Sin can be the same. In the, in the moment, sin makes some great promises and looks really good, feels really good. It can taste sweet, looks beautiful, but this isn't how it ends. Sin flatters us, drawing us in, like the adulteress here we're seeing in these verses, drawing, who, who draws this man in with her words. But all of that's a facade. The sweetness, the, this smooth nature that seems to be about sin, that's a facade. And just because something looks good doesn't mean that it is. Because look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Sin, it's, it's, it's honey, it drips honey, her words drip honey, smoother than oil, but, verse 4, but in the end, she is as bitter as gall, sharp as a two-edged sword. The adulteress seems so good in the moment, but this is how it ends. For a time, sin, sin seems wonderful. In verse 3, sexual sin, it is uh, described as smooth, sweet. But then in verse 4, it is something that is sharp and bitter. What seems so sweet at times is actually sharp and cuts us. That's the nature of sin. Sin, which can look so delicious, is actually disgusting and it poisons us. Sin, which seems like it's going to bring heaps of joy, actually ends in hurt. And sin, which seems so satisfying at times, actually robs us of joy and leaves us feeling empty and guilty. This is the nature of sin. Sin is deceptive. It deceives us. And we need to tell ourselves this about sin because when we do, it will ready us to fight. It will ready us to battle sin in the moment. The anger that feels so good in the moment because we're getting something off our chest actually destroys relationships and ruins people. And when we realize that, it will help us fight sin. Though it might seem good in the moment, we need to see the damage it's going to do. The sexual sin that might seem so satisfying is only going to leave us empty and guilty and in despair. Or the, the gossip that might feel so good as we pull other people down and try to build ourselves up is only going to end up destroying the lives of people and their reputation. Sin, in the moment, it promises to be great and wonderful, but it is deceiving us. And we need to remember that if we are to battle it. I picture it like this. It's like that mirage of water in the desert. When you're in the desert, it looks so good, you head for it to be satisfied with that life-giving water, but it is never found. Is All you find is a desert that continues on and on in the heat and will only destroy you. That's the nature of sin. Looks so good in the distance, you go for it, but it only destroys you. The goodness that you thought was there was never there. So be warned, as a Christian, be warned. Sin is deceptive, and its end is destruction. In fact, its end is death. That's what verse 5 and 6 now go on to say. Have a look. It's the second point. Sin now ends in death. Sin leads to death. Verse 5 and 6 say this. About the adulterous woman, her feet go down to death, her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the way of life. Her paths are crooked, but she knows it not. That's where sin leads. Here the adulteress, picturing all sin, shows where sin leads to death. And Paul says a similar thing. In Romans six twenty-three. the wages of sin is death. Sin deserves death. And even many sins in life can actually bring about death at times. But also, we know, as Christians, sin brings spiritual death. It brings God's wrath and anger upon us. And it brings eternal punishment. 
Here in these verses, we're seeing that the adulterous woman, she doesn't seek life. She doesn't seek what is good and instead is leading to death. And this is really the nature of all sin. Sin is not looking out for your good. It's not looking out for our good and what is best for us. It will not bring life or hope. Consistent, unrepentant, unforgiven sin will only lead you on the path to eternal death. And so we we need to be strengthened to kill sin when it may seem really good and sweet in the moment. We need to be strengthened to kill it by remembering that it leads to death and destruction. And then we come back to verse 7. Now we come to verse 7. Verse 7 here again gives a call like we saw in verse 1 and 2. And the writer says, And now, O sons, listen to me. Listen to me. Do not turn aside From what I say. Here again is a call to listen. So if you've been distracted, if you're getting a bit dozy, here is a call again. Listen. This is urgent. We need to wake up and listen because our life could be in danger because of the nature of sin and how it is deceptive and how it leads to death. So listen up again is the call from verse 7. And then we get verse to verse 8 to 11. And we see the next point here about sin, and that's the fact that sin damages your life. Sin damages your life. Look at verse 8. Keep to a path far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel. Lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life, you will groan when your flesh and body are spent. Now, verse 8, it commands us to not go near sin. We'll come back to that that a little bit later. But what I want us to see now is the reason why we must obey verse 8 and not go near sin. It's because of the answer that comes in verse 9 and following. It's because sin is the most expensive thing in the world. It costs us so much because it brings so much damage to our lives. Sin is deadly. A life of sin will cause riches to turn to poverty. It will cause time to be wasted. It will cause our strength to be drained. And at the end of our life, we will groan. We will groan that our lives and bodies have been consumed. That's what we see there in verses 9 to 11. For those caught by the adulteress, it says that that their honor, their years, their strength, their labors will be taken away and given to another because of sin. And all sin is like this. It it is all similar. It destroys our time. It can take our money. It can destroy relationships and our usefulness for Christ. Sin is like this. And so it's not worth flirting with sin because it brings this kind of damage to our lives. And one day, if we flirt with sin like this and continue on consistent in it, one day we will groan, like it says in verse 11, we will groan when we see the ruin that our sin has brought. We'll groan and moan over it. And as well, we will go on to say what verse 12 to 14 says. Have a look there. We see the next point about sin. Sin brings disappointment. It brings deep regret when we follow the path of sin. Look at verse 12 to 14. You will say how I hated discipline, how my heart spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers, Or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. We don't want to get to that point. But that is what the path of sin will lead to. And I wonder if Solomon himself may have one day said this. Because he didn't follow his own wisdom here at the end of his life. Here Solomon is speaking of someone who follows the path of sexual sin And they're now looking back and they're saying, I've wasted it. I regret all that I've done. I didn't listen to the wisdom that I'd been given from my instructors, from my parents, from whoever it was. I hated their wisdom. I despised it. And now I'm in ruin because I didn't listen. Will that be you? Will that be you one day saying the same thing? Will you neglect the wisdom that God is giving you right now even in this passage? Or will you heed to this wisdom? Will you one, be, one day be disappointed in yourself because you didn't listen to the wisdom that your parents gave? 
or maybe your mentors gave, or maybe that many sermons have given you again and again about sin? Will you one day be disappointed? Or maybe for you right now, you've come to this point of ruin. Maybe right now you're saying verse 12 to 14. Maybe right now you've come to that point. If that's you, or if you don't want to get to that point where you say these verses, then can I challenge you, listen now to the wisdom that God is giving us about sin. Because I don't want any of you to get to this point, and I don't want to get to this point. So listen now before you head, fall head first into that pit of sin and regret it. Finally, the final point here, just in relation to sin and what it is and exposing the nature of sin, the final thing we see about sin is that sin distracts us from God's good design. This comes in verse 15 to 20. Sin, and in particular, sexual sin, it is distracting us and taking us away from something that is better, from God's good design and His better way. That's what sin does. Look at verse 15 to 20. Drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Now, just before we keep moving, the picture here is of a wife. And it's showing here when it talks about cistern or well, is referring to God's design in marriage for a wife. So, verse 15, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. Should your springs overflow in the streets, your streams of water in the public squares, let them be yours alone, never to be shared with strangers. May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely doe, a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. We'll get to verse 20 soon. Here we see that this is God's good design, and sin only distracts us from this. In, in these verses here, the writer is describing God's design in marriage and the better way, the better way from sexual sin, the better way than sexual sin. And the point here is that sexual sin is to be resisted and not pursued because God has a better way. The way of sexual sin is to not be pursued because God has a better way in marriage. And it's far better than anything we could ever find. The way that God wants us to use our mouths, to use our lives, our bodies, our sexuality, is far better than anything that our sinful desires come up with and lead us into. And so we need to hear, the point is, we need to not let sin distract, distract us from God's better way. Don't let sin distract you from that, because that is what it's seeking to do. Realize that sin will only disappoint and God's way will only satisfy. So don't let sin distract you from that. So this is the true nature of sin. We've seen five things. Five things about sin. Sin deceives us. Sin ends in death. Sin damages your life. Sin brings disappointment. And sin distracts us from God's good design. And that's why we need to fight hard against sin. That's why we should want to battle it. And Remembering that about sin should help you want to fight because we don't want that. Remembering these things about sin should help you fight in the moments when temptation strikes. But now the question comes, but how do we fight? I've seen what sin is. I've seen what it's like. I've seen the call given to fight it. But how do we fight? Well, I see here in this passage as well five key tactics that we need to battle sin to fight sin in our life. And as we look at them, please keep in the back of your mind and please be praying in your mind that God by His Spirit would grow these things in us. That God by His Spirit would work this in us. As we're going to see at the end, it's so key. God works these things in us by His Spirit. We can only put sin to death by His Spirit, as we see in Romans 8. And so pray that God would work these things in you by His Spirit so that you are kept from the path of destruction and instead led on the path of joy as a Christian who fights sin because Christ has brought us life. So here we're going to see how do we fight sin, five things. Firstly, we need to desire wisdom. It's a pretty basic point, this one, but that's what we saw in verse 1 and 2 and in verse 7. We need to desire wisdom. That's what the 
proverb is giving. It's giving wisdom, and he's giving wisdom so that this son will be kept from sexual sin. And so we need to desire this kind of wisdom if we are to fight. We need to want more of it. We need to be gaining wisdom from God's word, but also other people, other Christians, if we are to battle sin. We need to listen to wisdom, rebuke, correction. And we need to listen to it and seek it from God's people. They can give us wisdom. But we also need to seek it from God's word. Because we won't be able to battle sin if we don't have the wisdom of God's people and God's word. We won't be able to battle sin if we don't have God's word and God's people correcting us when we fall. So we need to desire wisdom and seek it out. But this also means by implication that we need to be giving wisdom. As God's people, we should be giving wisdom to one another. And we should be seeking to correct and rebuke one another, like the writer does in this chapter, so that we stay far from the path of sin. You need to ask yourself, are you someone who gives correction and wisdom and encouragement to someone? You know the dangers of sin. You've seen them now. You know that you have a spiritual family and that Christians around you are your spiritual family. If you see them in the dangers of sin, are you just letting them go? Or are you coming alongside them, giving them wisdom and encouragement and correction? If people are stuck in the pit of sin, you need to come and help them. People cannot get out of a pit on their own. You need to come along and help them. It's part of God's design. Don't leave them stuck there. People need your help. And so we need to give wisdom, but we need to desire it for ourselves as well. That's the first key way we're going to fight sin. Desire wisdom from God's word and from God's people. Secondly, how do we fight sin? Well, distance yourself from the door to sin. That's verse 8. Have a look. Here in verse 8 we see, Don't go near sin. Don't go near sin and all that causes sin. Verse 8 says, Keep your way far from her, this adulterous woman, and do not go near the door of her house. How do we fight sin? It's, it's pretty simple wisdom here. Stay away. Stay away from it. Like 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Stay away. Be far from the adulteress, but not, it's not just don't go into her house, but don't go near the door of her house. Don't go near the path that leads to her house. Stay away, far from it. Just like Jesus says in Matthew 5, if your hand, right hand, causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If anything causes you to sin, the point is, get rid of it. Same point here. Stay far from whatever causes sin. Stay far from sin. If having your phone in your room at night causes you to look at porn, get rid of it. Leave it out. It's not worth it. If social media and pictures that keep coming up cause you to sin, cause you to covet, get rid of it. It's not worth it. If friends cause you to stumble, these friends you hang out with always cause you to stumble every single time. They cause you to sin. Or maybe you need to have a friend who can guard you from it there with you. Or maybe you need to cut them out. It's not worth it for the sake of your soul. We need to stay far from sexual sin, but we need to stay far from all sin and also all that causes us to sin, as Jesus says. So do this with your sin. Do this. Get to know the doorway to your sin. Get to know what is the path and the doorway that leads to the house of your sin and stay far from that path and far from that doorway. Ask yourself, what is the doorway to my sins? And stay far from it and cut it out. Hack it off, as Jesus says. Thirdly, how are we to fight sin? We are to delight in God's good design. Verse 15 to 20, this one we already mentioned a bit. We saw that point. Marriage is God's better way for sexual sin. Marriage is God's better way for sexual intimacy. Sin offers a way to please and we, and we think that's the better way. It looks good, but it will only destroy whereas marriage is God's better way. And God has a better way for all things in life. He has a good design for our words and our bodies and how we use our mind. And His way is better. 
just for one example, in particular marriage here, it's, it's raised, how is it the better way? Why is it better? Why is God's design the better way? Well, for example, in marriage, God gives us there a safe place, a union, a safe union where sexual intimacy can occur and where each person in God's design is to be looking out for the interest of the other person and where both of those people are in a committed, loving relationship to one another. Other relationships don't have that. There's a, there's a place of safety in marriage for sexual intimacy. And that's why it is God's better way. Other relationships only bring destruction. So don't go there. Don't go there. As verse 20 says, Proverbs 5, verse 20 says, don't go there. Why? Why be captivated, my son, by an adulteress? Why embrace the bosom of another man's wife? We've got a better way. That's what verse 9, 5, 15 to 19 have shown. Why go into sin and what it desires? Fourth, how do we fight sin? Verse 21 shows us that we need to do all things aware that God sees all. Do all things in your life aware that God sees all. We've heard this one before, we know it. Have a look, verse 21. For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord and he examines all his paths. We need to remember that God is watching. He knows the motivations for everything that we do. We'll give an account to him. He's the judge. We'll one day stand before him. And we need to remember this because knowing that God is watching us and that we will give an account to him changes so much when we really lock that in our minds and when it comes to our mind in the moment of temptation it will change so much so lock that in and you need to keep reminding yourself of it because when you are tempted by sin sin is enticing it's a trap we're told lies and we are told that it's going to be good, it's going to be great, it's going to be nice, but we know it's destructive. We're going to be told that God isn't watching or it won't do any damage, but we're told lies and we need to remember God is watching. He does know and we will be held to account. And so we need to know that God sees all and live like we really know this. That will help us battle sin. And then a final point, how do we fight sin? It comes in verse 23. We need to discipline ourselves. I'll read verse 22 and 23. It says, The evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him. The cords of his sin hold him fast. We've talked a bit about that. He will die for lack of discipline, led astray by his own great folly. A man who is trapped by sin, as verse 22 says, dies for lack of discipline. And so therefore the implication is, how do we fight sin? Well, we discipline ourselves. How do we fight sin? Discipline yourself. Sin is a deadly trap, and if we are to not be caught by it, we must train ourselves and discipline ourselves. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, train yourself to be godly. Like a soldier, like soldiers do, before they go and head into war, they train themselves, they discipline themselves, so they are ready for the war and for that fight and for all it will bring. They don't just run in there with no fitness, with no skills ready to fight. They train themselves. They discipline themselves ready for the fight. And we need to do the same to be ready for the fight against sin. If we had to wage war on sin, we must discipline ourselves. We must be disciplined in prayer. Praying we would have the strength to fight. Praying God's spirit would be in us to fight. We must be disciplined by being corrected by God's word. We must constantly be in God's word to be corrected by it. We must be in God's word so that we are memorizing key promises and passages to help us fight sin. We must be seeking accountability and disciplined in that way. We must be growing in self-control constantly so that we are ready to fight sin. We must be disciplined in forming boundaries that will help us avoid sin. And we must cut off, be disciplined in cutting off anything that causes us to sin as we've already said. Battling sin, it's going to take effort, isn't it? It takes discipline. As Hebrews 12 says, we need to strive for holiness. It takes a lot of effort and work. But there's something else we need to remember, which I've said already. 
we need to remember it's done by the Spirit, isn't it? Romans 8 verse 13 shows us how we put to death the deeds of the body. What does it say? It says, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. How do we do it? It is done all by the Spirit. And we need to remember that. Yes, we must be disciplined. Yes, we must train ourselves to be godly. We've, we must strive for holiness. All these verses we've already seen. But we must do it by God's Spirit, dependent on Him. To be disciplined in fighting our sin, we need to be dependent on God's Spirit. Both go hand in hand. Only someone, only a Christian who has their sin paid for by Jesus' blood and who has God's Spirit strengthening them now is able to kill sin. That's the only one, only person who can kill and battle sin. The one who has had their sin forgiven by Christ and who now has the power of the Spirit at work in them to put sin to death. So as as we close, I want us to end just with a, a great gospel reminder because it's a pretty heavy passage on sin and the nature of sin. But I want us to remember a great Gospel reminder from 1 Corinthians 6. Because we were all trapped in the pit of sin. Some of you may may still be trapped in the pit of sin, of unforgiven sin. But this passage here in 1 Corinthians 6 gives us great hope. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 says, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. None of those will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, he says in verse 11. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Sin is a deadly trap. We've all been in it. You may be in it now, but God is able to forgive. God is able to wash you and cleanse you. If you are stuck in the pit of sin, you can have Jesus wash you and cleanse you from all your sin, past, present, and future. He can wash you because of all he's done, as we know, on the cross. And so, If you are in the pit of sin and unsure if your sin is forgiven, take a moment. I want you to take a moment to think of your sin, to think of the damage it brings, the disappointment it brings, how it only deceives you, to think on how it is angering God. Think on your sin. And as you think on your sin, let it create in you a thirst for Jesus, whose way is better, who offers forgiveness who lets the guilty go free. May it create in you a thirst for Jesus. As you think on your sin and all the damage it does, may it create in you a thirst for Jesus who forgives, who makes us right with God, who restores us to God, who frees us from sin, and who fully satisfies us with eternal joy in God's presence. If you're not saved, come come to Jesus to pull you from the trap of sin from the pit of sin. He's the only one who can. He's the only one who can forgive. But if you are saved, I hope that as you have seen sin exposed, it has made you cherish again the forgiveness you have in Christ. And I hope as you have seen sin exposed for what it truly is and how deadly it is, I hope that it has made you want to fight it for the glory of Jesus who died to free us from that sin. Don't go running back to what he died to free us from. And when we do, be in utter turmoil and seeking forgiveness from Christ. He's able to forgive even when we do, as Christians run back. But we should be in turmoil when we do. And may these principles here help us to fight. So go back over the passage in your own time and remember how to fight when you see what sin is like. Because it's not worth it. It's not worth following the path of sin. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you've revealed the nature of sin here in this passage. And we thank you that 
For many of us, you've already revealed our sin to us and the deep need that we had to be forgiven. And we thank you that we have found forgiveness in Christ, that we have found hope, a way for the guilt to be gone, the punishment to be gone through Christ and all he's done. Thank you for this. And I pray for any here who don't yet know that, who are still trapped by their sin, caught up in the cords of sin, trapped in a pit with their guilt overwhelming them. I pray, God, that they would come now to to Christ and see the forgiveness that they can have in him. And I pray you would save and forgive. And I pray for all of us, God, who are, are saved, that you would help us to fight. May we desire and long to honor our Savior May we desire and long to honor Christ who died to free us from sin. And may we honor you, Lord Jesus, by seeking to battle sin in the power that you give through your spirit. And we thank you for this passage. We pray, God, that you would remind us of these things and that they would be applied to our lives this week for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to join